fellow alumni, fellow work colleagues, fellow friends of Mr Cook, thank you for being here today to celebrate the life of a remarkable man whose key purpose was the education and development of others. My name is Tom Frawley, alumnus and proud friend of Mr Cook's, and I'm very, very, very honoured to be standing here today. <clears throat> we will all remember Cookie in a variety of ways. He had a deep connection with many members of staff, the alumni and other members of the community and myself. Often I would walk past Mr Cook's office and he'd usher me in by saying, Frawley, Frawley, <laughs> have you got a minute? Have you got a minute? That minute would often turn into five where he would offer, you know, his views on politics, sport, the current state of the hospitality in industry and the machinations of the hotel school. <clears throat> As you're all aware, he was never backwards in coming forwards to speak his mind. <laughs> he would always start with something like this and he would say, <clears throat> in my opinion, the problem with the 360 degree review process <laughs> is that you go through this whole rigmarole and you end up in the same place. <laughs> now I'd stop and I'd think, what, what, what am I going to say? What, how can I counteract this argument? I go, but, 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 and then you could see him. You could see him getting worked up. His, his face would go the colour of a raspberry coolie and his jowl would start to wobble <laughs> like a turned out patacotta. And then he'd say, tell me I'm wrong, Frawley. Tell me I'm wrong. That was Mr Cook on a daily basis. To coin one of his sayings, in my opinion, in my opinion, a great chef requires three main attributes. The first is the ability to be able to create. Mr Cook spent many of his years before the hotel school creating fantastic dishes all over the world. We would often sit in his office and he'd tell me about his turbot with beurre blanc or something, okay? But he also created the school as to what it is today. I don't know how many other people can say that they created an institution quite like Mr Cook did. The second attribute of a chef is the ability to be able to control. For the large part, he was able to keep, I don't know how, but alumni like myself and the other alumni in, in the room somehow under control so that we've all succeeded today. He also kept the staff under control for, for a long period of time. <clears throat> However, there were a couple of things he couldn't control, namely who was going to win race four and his golf ball off the 11th tee. <laughs> but the third and what I believe to be the most important characteristic of a great chef is the ability to be able to lead. There is no doubt that Mr Cook had this ability. Great leaders guide and mentor future leaders, okay, and make you believe in yourself. They challenge your way of thinking. And Mr Cook did this for 27 years. He was genuinely, genuinely interested in the ongoing success of the alumni, the students and the staff. He knew where everybody was. Everyone gravitated towards him because he was the hub of the school. He was always prepared to stand up for what he believed was right. Okay, I could go on. Was he an orthodox leader? No. But was he effective leader? Absolutely. A great leader and a great, la and a great man. Be yourself, Frawley, he would say to me. Okay? And I think what I like about Mr Cook is I'd like to thank him for always being himself. Okay? And on that note, that's all I have to say for the time being. Because I please, we've, we've got a number of speakers here today who are here to share all of their stories and their memories with Mr Cook. Could I please welcome to the stage now lifelong friends, Tim and Libby Sexton, to share some of their memories of the great man. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom. Libby and I are very honoured to speak about Val given he had many friends and many lives to his life. He was our close friend for 38 years, which is about how long we've been married. We want to share those some personal insights about Val in his life beyond the Blue Mountains because I think we can claim unashamedly that we are his Australian family. On a lighter note, last night we had dinner with Mary Abris, who's in the front row with us here, Val's former wife, his next of kin and lifelong good friend. She shared with us the kind of funeral Val had requested in his will, which only was found yesterday deep, deep in all his mess in his room. <laughs> Mary asked us to read it to you, and Libby's going to read a very short extract from the will. I direct that my body be disposed of by my trustees with the least possible fuss and ceremony. <laughs> and at the least expense. <laughs> So sorry, Val, we learned too late about your requirements. <laughs> I think you would have enjoyed today's proceedings anyway, which to James this morning, my son, called the Cookie Fest. <laughs> Since 1979, we have worked and travelled with Val and enjoyed his company in our home. He's been an honorary uncle to our children. My daughter Emily answered the phone when she was about five and she came to us and said, that man is on the phone. <laughs> she didn't like him. We've called him that man ever since. We've recently learned that he called James his, grand, his godson and he certainly supported him like one throughout his career. James is a good man and a successful man and I think James can take, so Val can take some credit for that. We first met Val when he picked us up at Pusan Airport in April 1979. When as starry-eyed newlyweds and hotel management graduates, we were starting jobs at the new Commodore Dynasty Hotel. His greeting was classic Val. If I were you, I would get back on that plane now. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning this place is too tough for the young and inexperienced. Of course, we went out of our way to prove him wrong. We learned quickly that under that tough and sometimes outrageous exterior was a soft and caring gentleman with a great and often politically incorrect sense of humour. <laughs> Without Val, we would not have survived that year opening the hotel in Korea. We are sure many of you have heard Val's epic Korean tales. We can assure you that they are all basically true, with just a bit of Val's dramatics and humour <laughs> added. We talked about in Korea coming back one day, and in 2015 we did that. We went back to the hotel together. We had our, I don't know what you call it, our groundhog time. We had a wonderful couple of days reliving memories and marvelling how everything had changed. We met a, a staff member who had been a security guard there 36 years ago and now is now head of security and of course he remembered Val most warmly and fondly. And I'm hoping the photographs that are showing on the screen are following the story that probably aren't but, but we do have some photogra photographic evidence of what went on. Val's total delight was going to the old car park where a tent had been erected and the Korean ladies were making kimchi for the winter. Of course he couldn't wait to get his hands into it. We were treated royally by the hotel management. We flew back to Seoul, delighted we completed the full circle in what had been a really great adventure in our lives. During that trip, we spent some time with Blue Mountains alumni, Korean alumni, and how Val kept up the pace he did, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years younger, but I, I could not keep up with him the late nights and the, the partying, so <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Val shared merry, many Christmases with us after the first one in Korea in his capacity as honorary uncle. One of the first was with him and Mary at our house in Sydney. We all loved duck, but the oven died shortly after I had put it in. Perhaps it was a case of too much Chardonnay before lunch. But Tim and Val made the odd decision to put two fat ducks onto hot barbecue grill bars. <laughs> Within five minutes, we had flames jumping two metres high <laughs> and black charred ducks. In recent years, we hosted very large all-day family Christmases at our home in Albert Park in Melbourne. Val came along each year as our Christmas chef. A typical routine was Val arriving on Christmas Eve with a big ham. We'd have a quiet family dinner with lots of Chardonnay and an early night. Then up early on Christmas morning to cook for up to 40 for lunch and near that many staying on for dinner. Val endured Tim's bossing and fussing about, around cleaning up his mess with lots more Chardonnay and ice blocks. He would stand behind the kitchen bench in his apron, glass in hand, 
holding court with his stories and serving food all day. Our families grew to love him and were hugely disappointed on the odd year that he was not able to make it. It's no secret to people who knew Val that he lived life hard and he liked to drink, a bet and a big night out. But his health had declined in recent years, I think we're all aware of that. And the last time he stayed with us, and we, we, had, we just moved into a winery down in the morning to Peninsula called Main Ridge Estate. He wasn't well, and we all, I thought it was very ironic that we had a, a garage full of Chardonnay, and he couldn't drink it. <laughs> Ever on the ball, he called me about a week or so to say that um, a Blue Mountains graduate was now a winemaker like James, and his father was one of our regular customers. It's painful and hard for us to think of life without Val. Like all the best friendships, we didn't talk every week. We loved the way that man would turn up for a few days without any fanfare, just wanting to quietly join in with our lives, to enjoy some food and wine together and hear his latest tales and dodgy jokes. We loved his loud ranting at the television. All, all politicians and anyone who viewed as pretentious, or in Val's words, excuse me, a bloody wanker. <laughs> and we loved his genuine interest in and support to James. We love talking about old times at Westminster College Hotel School in London where Val Libby and I trained, some years apart of course. There's no doubt that like many old <coughs> Westminster lecturers, um, sorry, the Westminster lecturers that we, we experienced were like, a bit like Val, they were tough and caring and professional, but they had a large dose of cynical humour thrown in. We loved giving him random bottles of Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc from our cellar to drink, knowing that he was not at all fussy so long as an ice block was floating in it. <laughs> We loved all, all being Sydney Swans members in the early days when we were living in Sydney, watching Plugger kick goals at the MCG. We loved his intolerance of pretense and anyone who wasn't authentic, as he had a very sensitive, pardon me, bullshit radar. <laughs> <laughs> and on balance, I think people in the room will agree with this, that we're appreciative, it's a funny word to use, but we're appreciative of Val passed in relatively pleasant circumstances, as far as we know, without much suffering, with his mates, in this place that he loved. It occurred to us recently that the front Chardonnay vineyard at Mainridge Estate was planted about the time we first met Val in Korea. Every year we make just one barrel of sparkling Chardonnay wine from that fruit and name it after a family member. We pick the grapes as a family and that is the kickoff to vintage each year. The 2016 Chardonnay was named Cuvée Marlowe in honour of the birth of my grandson. The 2017 was named Cuvée MCM, the initials of my father on his 90th birthday. We don't sell the wine, we use it for celebrations. So, the 2018 sparkling Chardonnay will be picked around late February 2018 and will be ready to drink a year later. Only one name is possible for it. Cuvée Cookie. We already have the label ready, and of course, it is best served chilled, but not with an ice block. <laughs> Val, our families will miss you. Thank you, Tim and Libby, for those very kind words. Um, I'd now like to call on our next speaker, graduate from 1993 and great supporter of the school, Liz Long, and also lifelong friend of, 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 of Mr Cook's, Liz Wilburn. Thank you very much, Tom. Val Cook, Cookie, Mr Cook. People had various names for him, but I always addressed him as Chef or referred to him as Chef Cook. As part of the inaugural group in 1991, entering the gates of the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School, I felt a great sense of excitement. The journey that lay ahead of all of us was to be defined by the high calibre of industry leaders and lecturers, along with the opportunity to gain industry experience both nationally and globally. With my passion for cooking, I couldn't wait for my first cooking class. I was happily chatting away in class and I heard this voice. It was loud and it boomed and it was like everyone came to attention and was like, my name is Val Cook, you can address me as chef. <laughs> I knew immediately that this was not a man to be messed with and would not suffer any fools. Chef Mr Cook led us, 
sharing his passion and knowledge for the importance of quality produce and cooking techniques. As time went on, he changed from a boiling pot to more of a tempered chocolate. <laughs> and as he did, we the students grew to admire and respect him. Chef not only taught us about food and cooking, that was just the beginning. There were many, many life lessons to be learned. And in my case, I believe I'm in pretty good company. That often meant additional time in Mr Cook's office, which often meant you were in trouble. <laughs> you knew you were in trouble if you were summoned. That only happened, I think it was day three to me. So <laughs> it lasted the first couple of days. One of so many gifts he had was on one hand to put, to put the fear of God into you, but potentially, oh, sorry, put the fear of God into you potentially for not paying, playing by the rules. But in the next breath, it was time to move forward and get on with the job at hand. Mr Cook was always there to support the students, to help you get that dream job in that dream hotel, or whether the pressure was on for those final exams. He always had an ear, ready to listen, and a big heart. Don't get me wrong, there was always that really tough, cooky exterior that we all knew. But when you really got to know him, he would share his stories, the love of the horse racing, and of course, <coughs> golf. The contribution Mr Cook made from the moment he walked through those gates of Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School is impossible to ever put into words. The path that he helped create to ensure that every student had every possible opportunity to follow their dream is something we will all be incredibly and internally grateful for. The last chapter of Mr Cook's life, I believe, was one that really touched everybody who was part of the widespread Blue Mountains alumni community. Mr Cook's efforts with the highly driven team created a global network allowing current and past students to be constantly in touch with individual achievements and movements within the hospitality industry. I loved his Facebook messages at the end of every Friday, wishing everybody a very happy weekend. <laughs> On a side note, Mr Cook embraced Facebook. He loved it. I love it, as a lot of you would know. And um, I think the tributes that we saw come to life on Facebook, I, I've never seen anything like it in my life. My parents are here today. My mum said she's never seen anything like it. And I think he would be absolutely honoured and blown away from the global effect. That, and it just shows what a, a special, special man he was to so many. Uh, when I, uh, I know he loved the opportunity, sorry. I know so many loved the opportunity to see Mr Cook when he'd come to town, no matter where he was in the world. These were always very, very special times. I was so thrilled to see Chef in June in Melbourne. And when I left that evening, he gave me a prod, long, make sure you're in Sydney in October and make sure you say hi to mum and dad for me. I had the privilege of sharing tough times and so many wonderful times with Mr Cook. In my eyes, Mr Cook, chef, you are the godfather of the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School and a true educator. I am so honoured and privileged to have the opportunity to say these few words today and to be one of the first students with so many of my colleagues who I can see here to walk through the gates for the first time and for us all to be here today. Your attributes, qualities and values are an example which I believe will hold in our hearts and our souls forever. You will live on in your students and colleagues. You are a legend and legends don't die. Thank you, Mr Cook, and we love you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, our next tribute is going to be paid by Mr Fritz Gubler. And it was, it was 
Fritz's vision that really brought the, the Blue Mountains to life, and I think that he was largely somewhat responsible for getting Mr Cook uh, here to the Blue Mountains. So I, I, it's, I, I, I have great memories of early days at the hotel school with, with Fritz and, and, and Cookie and so forth. So Mr Gugler, please, thank you. Dear friends of Val, and I can see so many faces which have changed over the last few years, but uh, it's good to, to see you all, all again here. Maybe I've changed too. <laughs> Not many of us will have more than 3,000 Facebook comments on, uh, on our funeral, and uh, not many of us will have such a crowd attending it. But then Val never did what everyone would do. No, he always knew better. <laughs> and be honest, uh, often he did. He left us with a glass of Chardonnay in his hands in the company of his friends. And again, most of us would like to do the same. One thing he knew was how to motivate young people and how to look and appreciate his friends. And we can see that here today again. He was one of our first lecturers to join the Swiss-inspired um, Blue Mountains <coughs> International Hotel Manager School. He had no problems to emulate the three pillars approach the school introduced to Australia at that time. He championed that approach with a passion and a lot of energy. Val also assisted to introduce it to our campuses in New Zealand, in China, and to our charity project school, the Salabai Hotel School in Cambodia. That approach of skills training Professional knowledge and personal development became not only his mantra, actually he lived it, and the students believed in it, and the students believed in him. Professor Peter Jones was the principal of our school for four years. He sends his greetings from England to all the students and the staff who worked with him at the time. And he writes, during my time as a principal, I could not have wished for a more loyal, engaging, <coughs> and committed colleague. Wal Val could read the pulse of the school. He knew everyone, talked to everyone, listened to everyone, and also advised everyone. <laughs> His experience, knowledge, and innate understanding of people made him invaluable as a mentor and advisor. He represented the culture of the school, insistence on high professional standards, black socks, not gray socks, finding the best in people and helping and supporting when most needed. We mourn his passing but celebrate what he brought to our lives and to the thousands of students for whom he was the Blue Mountains Hotel School. I very much occur with Peter Jones' words. Max Player and I worked with, with Val for over 18 years. During this time, he established the leading hotel school, which we are immensely proud of. Over time, many staff members contributed to that success, but nobody was instrumental as well. Val, Max, Kevin, and myself, thank you for believing in us, believing in the fundamentals of our school, and believing in the students who pass through the school. Cheers, Val. I hope that they never run out of Chardonnay up there. <laughs> Thank you, Fritz. Uh, at Cookie's life, for many of you, was just the hotel school, but he also had a tremendous impact um, in the local community. 
I'd like now to call upon one of his local mates, Nicholas Darius, to come and share his, some of his recollections of, of, of Cookie. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Wow, what a turn up. Unbelievable. Val Cook Cookie. Val, membership number 1938. <laughs> Coincidentally, these were four of his numbers that Val used on his trifectas. <laughs> Whether it was Richmond Greyhounds, or it may have been Ipswich Greyhounds, Bendigo Greyhounds, <laughs> Devonport Greyhounds, or Wentworth Park Greyhounds. If it wasn't the Greyhounds, it was certainly the Gallops, especially on a Saturday afternoon. Val was known as the Sha Tin Specialist. Cookie and his Mates and his punters, there was Bob Felix, Billy Dave, Johnny Lenny, Gary, Mick A, Mick I. They had their table reserved in the TAB room every Saturday from 11.30. <laughs> Val checked up on their table daily at three o'clock, meeting up with Jimmy and Vic and anyone else that wanted to listen about the issues of racing or the issues of the world. Filling in a TAB ticket was not Val's forte. Making mistakes or making the wrong code was never Val's fault. It was, it was always the problem of the TAB or the machinery. <laughs> After a few years of knowing Val, we got to be familiar of his best mate, and his best mate was called Giddy Up. <laughs> Val would request Giddy Up every day, also requesting Giddy Up sheets every time we went down to the races, whether it be at Randwick, Rose Hill, Hawkesbury, or the Penrith Trots. His name would always be the first on the list to catch the bus down. Was Val Cook intelligent? Yes. Was he outspoken? Yes. Did he have an opinion on everything? Yes. <laughs> but most of all, he was a gentleman. Val was a loyal, valued and regular member of the Katoomba Cell Club, as well as the Alex Hotel. And in the past six months, he frequently visited the Wentworth Falls Bowling Club. When it came to a game of poker, Val was ruthless. He would intimidate the table, bluffing his way to the cash. <laughs> he would be sitting there quietly on the table, and then all of a sudden, you would hear this pommy voice yell about, I've had enough, I'm all in. <laughs> Everybody with their winning hands would just fold. <laughs> it was only three days prior to his passing that he won the local tournament down at Wimble Falls Bowling Club um, on the Tuesday night. Advice from Val was always free. <laughs> but it would cost you a Chardonnay or four. <laughs> Val would always give out advice on punting, sport, politics, how to conduct a raffle, how to make and lose money, and what makes a good glass of wine, and how loud bands should never play in clubs and pubs. <laughs> Hearing him bellow out the tunes, cheer, cheer, the red and the white, following the Swans grand final victories, was a moment that the members and the staff would never forget. <laughs> there are endless stories and tales that we could talk about. I will leave them for another day in the sports lounge. I'm hoping that Cookie finds a racetrack, giddy up, poker tables, glass of wine, wherever he ends up. He'll be missed but never forgotten. I'll leave you with a saying from Val which he used on us every day. It is only a rort if you're not in it. <laughs> on behalf of the management, on behalf of the on behalf of the management, the board of directors, the staff, and all the members of the Kachimba RSL, Val, rest in peace. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> uh, I'd now like to call upon Petra Brat, who's going to re recite an incredibly apt poem about Mr. Cook. Epitaph on a Friend by Robert Burns. An honest man here lies at rest, the friend of man the friend of truth, the friend of age and a guide of youth. 
Few hearts like his, with virtue warmed, Few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. One only had to be at the school on the Monday after Cookie's passing to actually realise the impact that he had on the school community. Uh, we all came together into, a, into the Fitzroy classroom and shared some stories. Now we're going to um, look at a few photographs um, of, of Cookie at, at work and, and at play. And I'd like to, for all of you to, to reflect on, on what Cookie meant to you and the impact that he had on, on your lives. So if we could please start the, the song so that we could listen to the song from his beloved uh, Liverpool football team. Thank you. When you Don't be sad. He wouldn't have wanted you to have been sad. Um, former club captain of Lura Golf Club and um, Paul Eastman would now like to, to read the, the 23rd Psalm for Mr Cook. Please welcome Paul Eastman. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil 
and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We have come here today to hear and share many stories about Val. Everyone here has their close and personal memories. But we've also come here to commit Val's body to rest in peace. And even though he has passed from this physical world, his inspiration, his commitment, his love, his passion, and his memories will forever stay with all of us. What really is beyond this point in terms of a life's journey is difficult to say with absolute surety. It's something based upon personal faith and belief. However, we all have that great hope that there is somewhere a tranquil five-star hotel lounge <laughs> looking out over a golf course <laughs> where the Chardonnay is ice cold. You can see the Swans and Liverpool play every match <laughs> and they win. <laughs> every horse you back's a winner. And most of all, you're surrounded with friends with whom you can share a robust discussion about what makes the world go round. With all of our best wishes, we hope that Val is checking in right now to rest there in peace. There's no doubt that Mr Cook left a legacy and I think it's the responsibility for everyone in the room to make sure that his legacy lives on by mentoring future leaders and, and, and caring for their friends and offering their opinions where, whenever sought. Um, ladies and gentlemen, shortly the, the pallbearers will be coming up, uh, up and, and Mr Cook will be leaving the room. At the conclusion of the ceremony, could I please uh, ask everyone to make their way up the driveway because I think that we should all um, <clears throat> make a guard of honour up the, the driveway and, and, and once the hearse has passed, you are all welcome to come and have a glass of shardy and to share a few stories of which there are many about how you remembered Mr Cook. Okay, and for those of you whose memories were here at the golf club bar, which I had a few, you're more than welcome to stay here and sit at the end of the bar and prop that up and share your stories. As I said at the beginning of this service, ladies and gentlemen, it has been my great honour to stand here. Um, I'll miss you and let's Cue that Swanee song, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs>